جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته. Peace be upon you all. Hello and good evening everyone. It is with our tremendous pleasure and honor that I welcome you all to the 8th CHS Research Seminar at Prince Sultan University. Prince Sultan University is a private university in Riyadh and it is proud home to all colleges, including the College of Humanities and Sciences. The CHS has multiple departments, including linguistics and translation, and is always excited to host seminars that encompasses many fields. Today, we welcome Professor Stephen Krashen, one of the most prominent figures in the field of linguistics. Professor Krashen has published more than 350 papers, books contributing to the field of second language acquisition, bilingual education, and reading. Today, our talk entitled Fundamentals of Language Acquisition, and he will be discussing 45 years of research that is uncovering language acquisition and the product of understanding, not production. This summary includes studies showing the power of self-selected voluntary reading, especially fiction. Those who read more develop more language competence, including vocabulary, grammar, and writing ability. The study also showed that the most important factor in improving literacy is providing easy access to large quantities of interesting and comprehensible reading material. So it is with our great honor that I welcome you, Professor Krasha, today. We highly appreciate your participation in the CHS seminar series at PSU, and we look forward to your delivered talk. Okay, thank you very much. Good. Uh, can, can we have the um, outline on the screen? Definitely. All right, thank you very much, because that's where all my lines are and all my jokes. I'd like to start by telling you a story, and the story really gives the whole lecture in an easy way. Uh, on the handout, it says an adventure at the supermarket. I want to tell you what I've been doing during the pandemic. Uh, I've been home during the pandemic. My inspiration has been uh, Isaac Newton, the famous physicist. During the uh, plague in London, uh, Isaac Newton stayed home. He was a student at the time at Cambridge and not a very good one. He was a mediocre student. He stayed home on and off for two years. During that time, he invented calculus. During that time, he did original brilliant work in optics and started his work on gravitation. That has been my inspiration. For me, it has been similar. It's been an amazing time of work for me. I know people have suffered a great deal with that COVID virus. It's been great. I've been home. I tell people I'm home alone with my girlfriend. <laughs> what could be nicer? I mean, we've only been married for 55 years. So at home, I've been playing, the, practicing the piano every day. I have been not just playing, but practicing. I've been doing my exercises. And I have been working on my languages. The language I've been working on is Spanish. I'm here in Southern California. And I have to tell you, I'm not very good in Spanish. Spanish for me is my fourth language, okay? Uh, but here's how I started early Friday mornings at the local supermarket, they have a special time shopping for old people. So that's when I go, I'm going there every Friday. And every time I go there, I go to the same checkout counter to pay for my groceries. The first time I went there, the man had his name tag on and it said Fidel. Now Fidel is a Spanish name. So I spoke to him in Spanish. He answered in English, which is what he's supposed to do. I continued. And I continued in Spanish. I said, Fidel, tú puedes ayudarme, you can help me. I want to learn to speak Spanish the way you do. Let's speak Spanish. He loved it because he felt we were on the same team. I've been speaking Spanish to Fidel every Friday for a year and a half. Now, my Spanish has gotten a lot better in that time. But it's not from talking to Fidel. We have great conversations. We not only talk, we, we gossip, okay? Who was it who said, if you don't have something good to say about someone, come sit next to me. So we do a lot of that gossiping with a good time. 
He sucks more quickly to me now. He uses more complicated language, so I'm getting better. And when I talk to people who are Spanish speakers, rarely I have a Spanish conversation. He said, Steve, your Spanish is so much better now. What are you doing? It's not from talking to Fidel. When I go home, I start reading. I've been reading lots and lots of very easy books in Spanish, what we call graded readers. I have several favorite authors. I have nice collections of these books, and I've been reading them for pleasure. Those of you who teach English know that the graded readers are getting better over the years. They've become literature. They're interesting stories. So I read my graded reader this morning. In fact, it's quite good, especially. So this is the idea. Uh, I can now start to read legitimate, authentic Spanish written by native speakers for native speakers. So I've absolutely approved. No question. This is my talk. I don't, I didn't get better by talking to Fidel. I didn't get better by studying Spanish, by conjugating verbs. I don't ask Fidel to correct my mistakes when we talk. It's from what we call input, the input of this pleasure reading that is so interesting that I forget that it's in Spanish. The books are that good. Well, I'm going to back up and repeat the whole thing in a much more boring way by telling you about the work over the last 45 years, the theory. It begins with acquisition learning. We have two ways of getting better in a language. You can acquire language. You can learn language. Acquisition is picking up a language. When it's happening, you don't know what's happening. You think you're having a conversation. You think you're reading a book. Of course you are, but you're acquiring language at the same time without realizing it. You, you, you don't know you're acquiring when it's happening. And when you finish acquiring, you don't know the new knowledge is there. It's buried in your brain somewhere. We are very good at language acquisition. The other process is language learning. Language learning is what we did in school. Knowing about language, talking about the rules, the subject and the verb are supposed to agree. That's conscious learning, knowing about language. Okay? The brain is not very good at conscious learning. And of course, that's what we do in our classes. We'll talk more about that. The next hypothesis we call the natural order. And this one kept us very busy in the 1980s. We can scroll down just a little more. Okay, thanks. Um, we found that we acquire, acquire, not learn, acquire the rules of language in a predictable order. Some come early, some come in the middle, some come late. For example, in English, the uh, progressive tense, John is playing the violin. That one is quite early. The third person singular, everybody knows, is late acquired. Our students have trouble with it, and we all know people who speak English very well who make mistakes on the third person singular. In fact, in first language, there might be a year between the progressive and the third person singular. Uh, this order, some of the order, is the same in first language, second language, not every single. I want to share with you some what I think are amazing facts about the natural order. Okay. Number one, you can't change it. You can drill the third person singular for hours and hours, but it won't be acquired until the acquirer is ready for it. Wow. The order is not from simple to complex. The early ones are not the easy ones to describe. We teach from simple to complex in our classes. That's not the order. The order the brain has is quite different. Number three, if you, uh, number three, you want to be thinking about rules when you, okay, let me back up. I've said this a little, I've jumped ahead. I looked at the wrong thing. The natural order is not the syllabus. We don't, uh, uh, Excuse me, I really need more coffee today. Um, the syllabus is not from simple to complex. I already said that. Excuse me for repeating. I'll have another sip of coffee. Um, what we thought in, it's not, it's not the syllabus, but I, I thought it was. Back in 1980, I gave a paper at the TESOL meeting in Los Angeles, and I said, we have the answer now. 
let's tell us what the order is, what the researchers have found. It will teach along the order. Big discovery, false. You, your teaching order is not the order of acquisition. It doesn't work that way. I'll say more about that later. But for now, I'll say the order of acquisition is the result of getting concrete, the result of acquisition. Okay, now let's talk about grammar. Um, what about grammar? I am not going to say grammar is forbidden. I am not going to say never teach grammar. Teach grammar, go to jail. No. My position about grammar is it's difficult. It's hard to learn and it's hard to use. We use our conscious knowledge of language to edit our production. If we're writing, we're about to make a mistake. We think we're not sure. We think of the rule and correct ourselves. And we sometimes try to do that when we speak. That's extremely difficult to do. Uh, there are three conditions we have to meet if we want to use grammar while we're speaking or writing. Number one, you got to know the rule. We don't know all the rules. I, I'm now I'm showing off. I'm bragging. I did a webinar with Noam Chomsky. What a privilege that was. Can you imagine? And we agreed. We don't know all the rules. Chomsky says we've only described fragments of English grammar. Now Chomsky knows more about English than anyone who has ever lived because his theory of universals comes from is working very closely with English and trying to find the right grammar. So Chomsky doesn't know all the rules. His colleagues don't know all the rules. The best teachers don't know all the rules. The best students don't understand all the rules we present in class. So you want to depend on conscious learning. You're dealing with a small, tiny part of the grammatical system. Number two, if you want to use the grammar, grammar, you've got to be thinking about grammar while you're speaking. Which is very hard to do. It's kind of like patting your head and rubbing your tummy at the same time. Very difficult. What we wind up doing, and I've done this, you plan your sentence while the other person is talking, and then you come out with a beautiful sentence, but it doesn't make sense anymore because you weren't listening to the other person. So this is dangerous. So it takes time. It takes time to apply the rules. Uh, these conditions know the rule thinking about correctness and have time to find the rule and apply it. This requires a lot of time and effort meeting these three conditions. It doesn't happen very often in real life. It happens, I think, only when we take a grammar test. If you're a student in a language class and you're taking a grammar test, you study the rule, you're thinking about the rules. It's usually a written test, so you have time to drag the rule up and actually use it. Even on grammar tests, we have found that people don't use grammar very much and they don't use it very accurately. Okay, we have now done the preliminary. If it's not grammar that helps us acquire language, how do we do it? This is, I'm talking about an experience many of us had as beginning teachers. You're in front of the class uh, giving, uh, telling a nice story, and your supervisor comes in and says, you shouldn't be talking, your students should be talking. You were right. Your supervisor was not right. It's through listening and understanding, reading and understanding. The ability to speak is the result of getting comprehensible input. Not only that, if you're forced to speak before you're ready, you're forced to speak too soon. You're forced to speak using what you've learned, not what you've acquired. It's quite painful. It doesn't help and it's extremely uncomfortable. I want to tell you a story that has to do with my daughter. It was quite a long time ago, it was like 45 years ago. She was down the street at a neighbor's house, and my task was to go over and pick up both girls and bring them to our house to play while our neighbor uh, uh, went to something she had to do. So I went over, I picked up my daughter and her little friend, about to leave, and my neighbor said, wait, wait, I need to do something first. She went into the kitchen. She said, I have to take my pill. She took a pill, anti-anxiety medication. I said, okay, now I can go. I said, you, you just took that pill. Why? You know, we're good friends, good family friends. She said, well, I'm on my way to Spanish class at the local college, and it makes me so nervous. 
I get so upset and nervous in class. I said, what is it about Spanish class that makes you nervous? Talking, being called on in class and having to speak before I'm ready. Can we move the notes down a little bit? Okay. I have looked at the research on this. I got very interested. I found other people that said this too. Well, having to speak the language in class is the greatest source of anxiety. Another one for every student in a beginning class, uh, speaking was the highest anxiety provoking activity. There are informal anthropological studies that find the same thing. Uh, one of them was done by a researcher named Sorensen, if we can move the page now, who looked at people in the uh, Amazon Valley, 10,000 people living in one area. That's not a lot of people. Uh, that if only 10,000 people come to a football game, that's not too many. And that group, they spoke 24 languages. The rule of the group was you cannot marry anyone who speaks your language. Isn't that something? So what happened is the children, their whole lives were acquiring languages. They acquired mommy's language, daddy's language, the language of their neighbors, the local community. They were doing language acquisition their entire lives. Sorensen interviewed them and found out how they did it. They all became multilingual. They all wound up speaking six, seven languages, everybody. Here's what he found. Here's a quote. They do not practice speaking a language they do not know well yet. They may make an occasional attempt to speak it. If it doesn't come easily, they will not try to force it. They allow themselves a silent period. They relax until it feels comfortable. It takes one to two years to be fluent in a language. I found that's true as well. If you talk to people who have acquired languages, picked up languages in the world, they'll tell you it's a year or two before you feel really good about it. Eugene Nida was one of the heroes, uh, one of the experts of language acquisition when I was a student. And he wrote a beautiful paper. He said he interviewed what he called African polyglots who went to neighboring countries and worked alongside of the people there and picked up the language. How did they do it? They didn't try hard. The next sentence I just love. They just seem to take it for granted that after listening to the language long enough, they would hear it. We just live there and listen. Before we know it, we think we can hear what they say. And there they mean by hear, they mean understand it. Get a, get a silent period, allow yourself to get used to it, don't force speaking. So that's one characteristic. The best input, if we want input to work, people have to pay attention to it, obviously. That means we have to say interesting things. We have to read interesting things. The word I like is compelling. We want interest, word research to, I'm sorry, we want input to be compelling. So interesting you forget that you're listening to another language. It's the message that counts. Another characteristic of acquisition, it's gradual. It doesn't happen all at once. I owe this knowledge to brilliant researchers at the University of Illinois and lots of studies. They've done first language studies and we have replicated this from the second language. They find that each time you read or hear a new word and it's comprehensible thanks to context, you don't have it automatically right away. Each time you get a little bit. And as you hear it more and more, you read it more and more, you pick it up, it takes 15, 20 times, spread out over time, and gradually you acquire it. This I think is true, we found it to be true in our research. We depend on context and get things a little at a time. People uh, have, not agreed with this. They said, well, context is dangerous. You can't trust context. Context can lead you in the wrong direction. Uh, this is a famous example. Here's a picture of a man pointing at something and you hear this that you don't understand uh, accompanying this. Now, does this mean finger? Does it mean hand? Does it mean okay? What does it mean? You don't know. Well, the studies they have done show that most context is helpful. A lot of it doesn't matter one way or the other. 
but about 60% will give you some clue as to what the word is. It will rarely send you off in the wrong direction. Isn't that interesting? So it has to be that way. Otherwise, we would never acquire language. Well, this is the theory today. I want to talk about application and give you a new vocabulary word. Today's word is the conduit hypothesis. And the hero of the story is going to be stories. I'm going to conclude that stories are the core of language teaching. A synonym for stories, fiction. A synonym for fiction, literature. This is the magic. This isn't the only way to acquire language, but it's a very good one. And we go through several stages, and each stage helps the next day. I'll go through that. Um, I'll tell you about an experience I had about five years ago when I first realized how powerful this was. I live about oh, 40 minutes by car, by automobile from Los Angeles. And the uh, closest town in Los Angeles is Santa Monica. And I used to go to Santa Monica, Venice area, at least one. I had two reasons. Number one, I had to go to Gold's Gym and lift on Venice Beach and say hello to Arnold Schwarzenegger because he was there. Very nice guy, by the way. Uh, and also I had to go see my grandchildren because I'm totally hopelessly addicted to my grandchildren and they live in Santa Monica. So I had to drive there twice a week. It's a 40 drive each way. And I find it really boring. What do you do in the car for 40 minutes twice a day? Well, you listen to the news. The news is depressing, depressing, depressing. It's all Donald Trump anyway. And now it's all about Russia, Ukraine. Oh, depressing that is. So then I started listening to music. That had to change because the radio stations may have wanted to make more money on this. They put all the good music, by good music, I mean the Beatles, really good stuff. They put them on special programs that you had to pay money for. So I was stuck. I went to the library, the local public library, and I took out audio books, books on tape, books on disc. I went to the Santa Monica Library, which is lots of fun. My daughter was working there at the time. And I looked at the audiobook collection, recorded stories. They didn't have other languages, all English. They didn't have great literature. I'm a college professor. I want Shakespeare. No. They just had bestsellers. I listened to bestsellers. I listened to detective stories. I listened to historical novels. I listened to legal novels, John Grisham. Here's what I found. Popular literature, bestsellers, were pretty good. In fact, a lot of them were wonderful. My first adventure in popular literature, Harry Potter. Harry Potter was written for us. It was written for educators. It's all about school. What happens in school? <clears throat> it's all about the adventures of Harry and his friends, Hermione, of classes and the good teachers, the bad teachers. The Hermione, you may remember, was the good student who always had her hand up and knew all the answers and was considered the smart student. One of my uh, students wrote an essay called, Is Hermione Smart? Is that what we want from school? Brilliant essay. Very, very good question. So I discovered popular literature and grew to respect it profoundly. The first stage in literature is stories. The teacher telling stories to the students in class. Now we have a lot of research on this in first language. Here's what it says. Children like stories. Mommy and daddy's out there. You know this already. 90% of the children the interview loved hearing stories. The ones who didn't like it when their parents told them stories or read the stories, the parents didn't like telling stories. I can't imagine that. That's how it those who heard more stories were better prepared for school, did better in everything. Okay. Um, and they grew up to read more on their own. Can we move down on the handout? A little more. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, the way we do this in classes, in beginning classes, I like the technique that my colleague Benico Mason does. It's called story listening. And here's how she does it. And it, it, there's a website for it, storiesfirst.org. See how she does it, see examples. She used, she, she pioneered this 
in English as a foreign language in her university in Japan. She used, at the beginning level, stories from Grimm's fairy tales. She liked those because they're of universal interest, they're largely excellent, um, etc., etc. She would find the stories, read them through, prepare them by picking out the grammar and vocabulary that she thought that the students would have trouble with, and had pictures, drew pictures to illustrate them, uh, explained them more in the language, uh, rarely did a translation quick one into Japanese, etc. What did we find in the studies? We didn't ask the students to think about the words, don't write down the words. We found the students picked up a surprising number of new vocabulary, even when they're tested two weeks later. We tried one study where we added traditional vocabulary exercises to read the first thing together. That is good. You're better off listening to another story. Don't do vocabulary exercises. Tell another story. Uh, uh, people have complained, well, how do we make sure they get the frequent words that they really need? They'll get the frequent words because they're frequent. They show up in all the stories. They keep coming up. So this is how people acquire the language in general. Stage two is reading. And this is the method that uh, Dr. Mason pioneered. And I actually used it uh, driving to the supermarket. Okay, And I'm still reading these graded readers. In her classes, she would start out with guided self-selected reading, students who've already had stories. They've been in these stories classes for a semester, two semesters, okay, or more, okay, and had built up a fair amount of competence in English. The first day of guided self-selected, Dr. Mason would come to class with a wide collection of graded readers, easy ones. The students would sit around a table and look at the books and themselves would choose what they wanted to read with the help of the teacher, with some discussion with the teacher, eventually moving to self-selection. What our goal in these classes is gradually bring the students to the point, and this takes a couple of semesters or more, where they're reading authentic books, not just graded readers, and selecting them themselves. This is the effect, the effect of this program. Now, going on to the part that says research, I want to tell you what the research is on self-selected pleasure reading, which I think is the secret of advanced competence in a second language. Here's Dr. Mason's study. The um, test that we gave them is called the TOEIC. Some of you are familiar with this. This is the most frequently given test of English in the world. And uh, we use the parts on uh, listening comprehension and reading. Students who did Dr. Mason's program, who did the guided self-selected reading over time. We had the students, the students volunteered to do it. They kept a record of all the books that they read. There wasn't a quiz, there wasn't a test. They didn't have to, you know, tell the story again, nothing like that. Just read the book, go on to another one. And we could compute from that, estimate how much time they put in in reading. Our result, this is astonishing and it's been replicated. They gained more than a half a point on the TOEIC for every hour they read. Now the TOEIC goes from zero to a thousand. Our estimate, they started around 250 after they would had the stories in class. If you come to school for say two and you read for pleasure for two hours a day, that's reading you want to read that you select. This isn't the hard work of an EFL class. This is reading for pleasure. You don't like the book, you put it down, get another one, etc. Books that you like. You do this for a couple of years, you go from the lowest levels of the TOEIC nearly all the way up to the highest. You're quite well prepared for academic in English just from having a good time, just from reading. I want to run through some more research on this, give you a feel for the uh, range of research we have. This is only a brief survey of 1% of, of the research, even less. One of my favorite studies, Fei Shin, the second author, was uh, my student at the time, and uh, she organized the study. It's about a student named Sophia, who had been an ESL student, but was now officially an English speaker. In high school, the school she went to, junior high school, high school, they uh, gave the reading comprehension test in the fall, 
you first came to school. Then they gave you another test in the spring at the end of the year. Sophia, every year, got worse. The fall, her score was pretty good. And in the spring, she got worse. Her score was lower. Then the next fall, she would come back, take the test again. She was higher than she was the last spring, higher than she was the last fall. She made up the loss and got even better. What was going on during the summer? She went to the local library and took out books that she wanted to read. She read Nancy Drew Mysteries. She read Sweet Valley High, the books that kids her age liked. She averaged about 50 books each summer, books that she liked. Her mom, who was Professor Lynn, the first author of the study, she said, you know, school isn't doing my daughter very much good. Maybe we should let her stay home. She'll do a lot more good. So paid off the importance of the library. Next study, DeVries, I love this study, 1970. It's two pages, you guys. It's a wonderful study. You can read this in a few minutes. Totally comprehensible. This was language arts. This was a class that lasted for two months. One group of students in grade five, 10 year olds, um, took the regular class that you take in school. They were uh, required to read two, two papers, two themes a week. I'm sorry, write two themes a week for nine weeks, which is traditional. Writing is going to help. No, it doesn't. They were excused. The second class did no writing. All they did was read. They made use of the time for an increased amount of reading in and out of class. So one group did this forced writing two themes a week. The other just read. Who did better on the final essay? The readers did much better, not even close. They were better in content mechanics, organization, grammar. Uh, C and Lee is the next one. A uh, course in Taiwan for college students, English is a foreign language. Good statistics, multiple regression, which I really love. She found what are the predictors of how well they wrote? How much reading they did on their own? Yes, strong predictor. How much writing they did on their own didn't help at all. Zero. It was reading that helped, not writing. It was the input. Two famous cases, Richard Wright. Richard Wright grew up in a family very traditional. His grand grandmother would not allow books in the house. She thought they were evil, full of lies, bad for you, etc. Um, but Richard Wright wanted to become literate and write and do all these things. He tried to get books out of a library, but he was African American, and the library did not allow African American children into the library. So he got a friend of his who was white to take out books for him, and he started to read. Here's what he said: I bought English grammars and found them dull. I felt I was getting a better sense of the language from novels than from grammars. Wow. Richard Wright became one of the most famous African-American writers, profound everything you'd ever want from a writer. Malcolm X, another hero. Malcolm X grew up in a high poverty neighborhood with lots of crime. He got into the sort of ran with the wrong crowd, um, was sent to jail, he had to go to prison in his early 20s basically highly illiterate, uh, nearly totally. And when he was released from jail after a couple of years, he was already writing. He was the voice of the African-American intellectual at the time, wrote brilliant things. Uh, how did he do it? Someone asked him, a newspaper reporter called him up and said, what is your alma mater? What was your school? He said, books. In prison, he discovered books. He discovered the library. He said, my prison studies were reading. You couldn't have gotten me out of books with a wedge. He read everything. At night, when the guards came around to see if the prisoners were in bed, he was in bed under the covers with a light reading books, okay? So it was reading that made it happen. I've just given you a taste. If you want to see more, here's a, a link to my book, The Power of Reading, uh, which you can get for free, okay? Don't buy it, it's too expensive, right? We have also found from the research that fiction is what counts in reading, that really works. In fact, one study, this was done at the University of London. This is a group of scholars who interviewed and studied the same people over 40 years since they were tiny children 
until they were adults. The last time they did it was when they were in their early 40s. They interviewed them, native speakers of English in London. They gave them a vocabulary test and a questionnaire. Here's what they found. Those with the largest vocabularies, of course they read the most, but it was fiction that really counted. What they called middle brow fiction was the best predictor of vocabulary knowledge, better than nonfiction. Can we scroll down, please? Move the slide down. Oh yes, people get concerned. Well, what if, uh, how do you make sure if you read all this fiction, um, how will they get academic language, the language of school? Well, our hero here is a guy named Jeff McQuillan. Uh, Jeff McQuillan was my student. And uh, when I talk about him, I like to quote the line from Star Wars. I was the master. You were the student. Now you are the master. And I am the student. That's Jeff McQuillan. He has become the total master of this research. He has some blogs. He posts things. He writes papers, etc. If you look under backseat linguist, you'll find a lot of short articles, long articles by Jeff. This is just two of his many wonderful papers. He looked at the vocabulary in the seven Harry Potter novels, did an analysis. He found the vocabulary there, a lot of it is academic. It's in the official lists of academic words, and they appear often enough, 12 times or more, a lot of them, so you have a good chance of acquiring them. If you read all seven Harry Potter novels, you'll get 204 academic words that are used in all areas of study post-secondary school. And his calculation was far more efficient than studying these words the way we do it. Another article Jeff McQuillan did, Reading Matrix, Open Access Journal. He looked at novels, young people read Nancy Drew, Twilight. 85% of the words in the academic words uh, were there. And a lot of them appeared 12 times or more. His prediction, in one year, if you read 30 minutes a day, you'll acquire about a third of the vocabulary you need for school. One of my favorite studies, Rolls and Rogers, I found out about this through McQuillan's work. If you read a million words of science fiction, you will find 92% of the important words that you need for all areas of science. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, that's number one. Reading gives you language. There's a lot more. People who read more know more. They know more about science. They know more about history. They know more about practical matters. They know more about everything. The big paper here, which is phenomenal, Stanovich and Cunningham, you can find this somewhere, check it out. They look at college students, they tested them, as you can see, on lots of subjects, science, social studies, finance, health, uh, cultural knowledge. Here's some sample questions. Where's the Panama, Pan Panama Canal? Who's Linus Pauling, etc. They also got for all their subjects uh, a number that recommended that represented how much they interacted with print, how many books they read, and how many quality magazines they read, good articles. People with higher scores on print exposure were better on all of the tests, all of them, folks. That was the best predictor. How much reading, how familiar are you with books and magazines? That was the best predictor of all of these areas, okay? Other things didn't count. Your high school grades didn't count. Your, your ability to do the sophisticated thinking, the rate of matrices, that didn't count. Mathematics was significant, but very weak. Reading how well you read, not very good, low. How much TV, negative. It was print that did it. The more you read, the better off you are. Compare this to the effect of doing your homework. Here is Alfie Cohn, brilliant. Look at the results of his survey of the research. There is no any academic benefit from assigning homework in elementary or middle school. Young, uh, not even a correlation, okay, between whether kids do homework or how much and achievement. At high school, the result is weak and disappears when you do better statistics. Thinking what I'm thinking, all this time on homework that doesn't do any good, that just drives you crazy. A recent study I read, high school kids average three hours a day on homework, no time to play with their friends, read through 
and family just doing homework, the impact on test scores, practically nothing. If they, if we could reduce homework a little bit and give kids more access to books for pleasure reading, we'd be much better off. Okay, let's scroll down. Okay, readers also get what we call habits of mind. Re readers who read more, if they read a lot of fiction, have more empathy. Um, when you read fiction, you live other people's lives. You think what other people are thinking. You get a better view of the human race. You begin to suspect simple solutions. You realize the world is complicated. A wonderful quote from Barack Obama. He was interviewed by The Guardian, British newspaper, about what's your reading habit. Now, uh, President Obama did not read the same research I just told you about. But these are his conclusions he's come up with by himself. I think how I understand my role as citizen, most important stuff, I think I've learned from novels. Wow. It has to do with empathy. Be comfortable with the notion the world is complicated. It's full of grace, but there's still truth to be found. You can connect with someone even though they're very different from you. Noam Chomsky said something very similar. Chomsky has said, we'll probably find that we're going to learn more about human thinking from reading novels than scientific psychology. Now, if all this is true, the big issue is access to books, good libraries, good librarians who are going to help. Benico Mason and her program, the kids had access to 5,000 graded readers. That is delicious. That's wonderful. Keith Curry Lance is the leader of this research in the United States and Marvel's work. Public schools with good school libraries, that means good collections, and an expert librarian, the kids read better. How do you like that? So this is the solution. I want to close with a little brief sermon about the advantages of kids selecting their own books. Very important. Uh, I want to begin this by talking about my experience. I have this on the bottom. This will get you in the mood for it. When I, because I'm going to give you my experience and my prediction is you had the same experience when you were in secondary school. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Alicia. That's a beautiful quote. Absolutely right. Um, my experience when I was in secondary school, I took the required English class and we did British literature, American literature, and we did required reading of the classic literature. I read all the required literature. I took all the tests. I passed all the tests. I don't remember a single book I read from secondary school. Not one. Zero. I do remember the books I selected on my own. I remember all of them. I read two categories. I read science fiction, Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, etc. And they were wonderful. I remember them all. I still, when I read in other languages, I always look for science fiction first. Okay. And I read baseball stories. I found an author. I found this in the uh, one of my cousin's bedrooms. <laughs> book by John R. Tunis, a kid from Tompkinsville, a 19-year-old who comes to the major leagues and is an incredible player. I think it's injured. He hurts his elbow. He can't pitch the ball. He comes back. He's in a different position and becomes fabulous. It's all about getting up, starting over again, solving your problems. Gripping, gripping book. Wonderful. These books are so good, I reread them over the years. I, I, I met a friend, a good friend of mine now is my friend Seymour. I'll, I'll tell you about Seymour, then I'll tell him that I've made him famous in Saudi Arabia. Um, Seymour Pearl was my doctor once, and then he went to this medical center. And we got along famously and just talked and said, he liked baseball. And when he resigned, he quit, he retired. He contacted me and said, I want to meet with you. Let's have coffee. So we've been meeting for the last four years, and we've been rereading these books and talking about them. It's been Wonderful. These books gave me the philosophy of life that I needed. They gave me what literature gives me, as well as knowledge of the world, etc. Okay. Uh, the research on this is, I think, quite brilliant. Uh, the best, besides my own experience, let me share with you again the experience I think you've had. You have found, I am sure, that when 
it's really a signed reading. What you dread is when the person says, how did you like the book I gave you and you haven't read it, right? Well, because it's a signed reading. Here is what Garrison Keillor says about it. She says, as a former English major, I am an easy target, a sitting duck for gift books. And in the past few years, I've gotten Dickens, Thackeray, Small and Richards and Emerson Keys, all of them great, none of them ever read by me. All of them now on my shelf, looking at me, making me feel guilty. Same with me. No, I hate getting books as gifts. Well, especially novels, nonfiction sometimes is very good, it's professional, but novels. There is one exception, there's one person, when he recommends a book to me, I take the, I take it very seriously and I always read it because he knows me better than I know myself. And that of course is my son. When he tells me to read a book, I read it right away. He's absolutely right, dad, this is for you. Other experts say the same thing. Donald and Miller, creating a classroom where readers flourish and beautiful paper. No single practice inspires my students to read as much as the opportunity to choose their own books. Isn't this wonderful? Also, one of my former students, I mentioned her, C.M. Lee, compared a signed reading, signed reading and self-selected reading, where the assigned reading was teachers did a good job selecting books based on movies. Self-selected one, they made more progress. So simple conclusion today. What we want is self-selection, lots and lots of access, and give them time, and I hope a comfortable place to read. And our problems in literacy, I think, will be solved. I think it means at least giving it a try, reducing the homework even just a little, giving more access to books and more time to read. I am so professional. I finished exactly in 57 minutes. I am so proud of myself. It gives us some time for questions. I am going to plug in my computer before I run out of juice here. Yes, I'll definitely. Uh, if you have any questions, please post them within the chat box so we can read it. Thank you so much, Professor Krashen, for this amazing and insightful talk. Mm -hmm.